All right, we will get started our normal time, 7.05. Uh, we'll be doing uh, 1 Corinthians 10. Uh, we're going to get into the first 14 verses tonight. And also, I know I, I believe I announced it on Sunday would be, oh, excuse me. On Sunday, we'll be getting into a discussion about grace. Um, that's going to be not this Sunday. This Sunday is going to be Easter Sunday, uh, but the following Sunday. So this Sunday, um, it's going to be a, a short message, and then we are going to have fellowship here together. And... Um, it's actually going to, going to be at 9 a.m. instead of 10.30, uh, but it will be online. So uh, if you can't make it live uh, Sunday morning, um, it, will be, it will be there for you. Uh, we'll just give a couple more minutes here, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, we're going to do 1 Corinthians 10, uh, first 14 verses, okay? Um, interesting. I was, I was reading over this, and, and, and uh, I thought it was quite interesting um, what, the, what Paul's going to be talking about. He's going to be talking, he's talking to these, um, uh, you know, the, these Corinthian Christians that are just they're just a mess, and uh, you know, the, the spiritually and the physically struggling, uh, not sure what they should let in, what they should keep out, you know, what 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 they're supposed to be doing with these things. So I think it's interesting uh, the way he goes about this and and kind of uh, lays it out to them, and uh, so we'll get into that. Um, what do we got, another minute? All right, another minute, and we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, people jumping on are just going to have to go and restart. So anyway, um, yeah, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 through 4. Hey, hey, Lisa, hey, Paul, Paul, I need to talk to you, man. Um, <laughs> I will, I will send you. Been meaning to get get. I'm been meaning you to get with you. Um, I will send you a message with my phone number. Give me a call so we can have a quick chat. And then right after Easter, uh, you know, I, I, we're gonna we're gonna we'll talk. Let me put it that way. We'll talk. <laughs> and then, uh, okay, good. <laughs> Yeah, I've been meaning to get to you. I'm just so busy, man. I got so much, there's so much going on, and uh, I got people sick and all the other stuff that's happening. So I apologize, I haven't gotten back to you, but we will, we will chat. We will chat. All right, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll get you started. All right, I'm fully convinced we're gonna have, we're gonna get you going here, um, but we'll talk about that. All right, in private. So. Okay, we ready here? All right, we'll just, if everybody else comes on, they're just going to have to uh, restart or whatever. All right, uh, so as I said, uh, we'll be doing um, the first 14 verses, 1 Corinthians f uh, 10, 1 Corinthians 10. Um, and so let's go ahead and let's pray. And then we'll dive right into our reading for tonight. Uh, just, just a great... You know, great week, uh, big, hey, John, how are you, man? Um, just a great week this week, uh, just kind of meditating on everything that the Easter week brings. Uh, you know, I, I think it's interesting, I was making this point uh, that, you know, on Palm Sunday, you know, Jesus comes triumphantly into Jerusalem 
And then by Friday, you know, he's on the cross. And how quickly things change. He comes comes in at a king. Everybody loved him. He's our savior. Bang, Friday, a few days later. So it's kind of going to feed into what we're going to talk about tonight. Like, you know, people that are exposed to the same thing, people that see the same thing, they hear the same thing, but yet it affects them differently, quite differently. And uh, so we will... Hey! Hey, guys. Glad to hear you. Glad to see you guys are here. Okay, so let's go ahead and pray. Uh, let's go ahead and pray, and then uh, we'll go ahead and dive right into our reading for tonight. All right. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this time that we can come together. Lord, that we would come to realize and understand the spiritual food that you give us. Lord, when life gets tough, we understand that when everything that we see is falling apart, it's the things that we don't see that are holding us together. Your spirit, your grace, Lord, our Christ, God the Father, you're always there for us. So as we read tonight in your word, we pray that you would give us understanding and discernment, Lord, that you would be here with us, that this baptism that we talk so much about, the baptism of the spirit, that we would come a little better to understand what that means and that we would carefully examine what's going on around us in our lives. Lord, that we could be a good example for all those around us. So Father, we pray that you would be with us here tonight, that this message would be your message and this would all be about you. And it is in Christ's name that we pray and all God's people said, amen, amen. Okay, go ahead and, and turn your Bibles over. 1 Corinthians 10. Let's get started. Verse 1. He says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want... Remember where we left off. It's, this is, this is a good, good idea. It, we go up to verse 27 in, in chapter 9. Look how he leads this. Look, at, look how Paul leads this. and then Because the chapter breaks were added later. But he, ro he, he kind of rolls right into this. Uh, chapter 10 here. Look at verse 27. He says, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Beautiful. How are we supposed to talk to others about situations when we ourselves are overwhelmed by them, when we ourselves are struggling so deeply with them? We're supposed to minister to others in things that God has helped us overcome, right? That leads us right into chapter 10 here. He goes, moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. You see what he's, he's setting the stage here, isn't he? What's he saying? They all experienced the same thing. They, they saw it. They heard it. They experienced it. But look at verse 2. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual food. For they drank of the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So scripture tells us that there was a, a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire that followed them day and night. It never left them, right? And So they all experienced this. We, we know from looking back on it, that that's Jesus Christ that was with them, okay? So what we see here is he's making this point. He's saying, listen, they all, they all experienced the same thing, all these big spiritual milestones, right? Look at verse 5. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Ouch. Okay. Is it possible that different people will get different things from the same experiences, hearing the same thing, and come out with a different understanding of it? 
I, I think we could say without a doubt, yes. Why would we think that wouldn't carry over into the spiritual realm? Why would we think that wouldn't carry over into the things that we hear from God? Right? Of course it does. Of course it does. Look what he says. Verse 4. They all drank of the same spiritual drink. They drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. Verse 5. But most of them God was not pleased with. I think this. This is what I think. Depending on the condition of your heart. Okay? Depending upon the condition of your heart. Depending on where you are in life and your willingness to accept things or to question things, right? Let me take you over to a piece of scripture that you're probably all very familiar with, and that's the sowing of the seeds, okay? It says that some seeds were cast on the hard wayside, and the birds came and ate them away, and, and, and you know they didn't take root. And then some in, in the rocky soil where they quickly sprang up but had no depth of root. And then the thorns and the thistle, thistles were growing between them and it choked them out. And then some seed fell on good ground that, that came and bore fruit uh, to, to a great measure. Okay, so common understanding is... Most people think those are four different sets of people, okay? Maybe, maybe. If your heart's not ready, definitely the seed's not going to get planted. Sometimes the seed is planted and, and you just, you know, you're, you're too new to it all. It can't take deep root uh, or it takes root and then you let too much of the world, the thorns and the thistles in and it kind of chokes out the word or... You know, once you get some some time under your belt, once you are walking with the Lord for a period of time, that that's when the fruit will come. You know, I can I can see that. To me, I believe these are all stages that we go through. Because I remember a time when I was that hard, rocky wayside. I remember a time uh, when I was you know that rocky soil, right? I was on fire for the Lord, but the first time something happened, it just, you know, burnt it right up. I remember, you know, t taking, getting, getting a little root down and, 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 you know, trying to step out into ministry and, and spiritually being there and, and uh, letting too much of the world in. And it kind of drowned it out like my focus and where I was going. Um, I think that we all go through these four stages in our walk. Um, I will say this, the first stage, they are not saved. There, there's just no possible way. If the implanted word has not started to grow, you are not saved at that point. You've been introduced to it, uh, maybe you heard a little bit here or there, it's not for you, right? Then what happens? Life happens. And you, you come a little bit deeper into it. And we understand, again, it took root, but it had no substance to it. Therefore, when the, you know, the fire of life, the fire of the day came, when the difficulties hit us, right, it was burned up quickly. I think this makes perfect sense that these are stages that we go through. All right? Now. Go back into what we're talking about here. They all saw miracles. The presence of the Lord was with them. They went through the sea. Spiritual food, spiritual drink. Yet it says that God was not happy. Look at verse 5 again. But with most of them, God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. This wasn't a little thing here, right? They had rebellion in their heart. They weren't moving from stage to stage to stage. God gave it to them, right? He gave full force to try to turn them to him. And instead, what were they? 
We're going to talk about that a little bit more. Let me take you over to Numbers 14, and that and I missed the header on this one. If you guys got this email uh, with the, uh, if you got this email with the uh, companion scriptures, I missed the header on this first one. I, don't ask me why. Anyway, it's Numbers 14, verse 26, and in verse 26 it says this: And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. The Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying. How long shall I bear with this evil congregation who complain against me? I have heard the complaints which the children of Israel make against me. Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, just as you have spoken in my hearing, so I will do to you. The carcasses of you who have complained against me shall fall in this wilderness. Interesting. He saved them to what? <laughs> Let them fall in the wilderness? What is God, what is God more? Think about it like this. What is more important to God? That you be comfortable here in this life? Or that you come to him fully so that you can spend eternity with him? See, too often we get this thing in our head and our in our focus and in our that, you know, why is it so tough? Why is God doing this to me? Why is this happening? See, they were saying the same thing. God says, why are you complaining, right? What I'm doing here is I'm doing something, right? What, what does that scripture say? Behold, he makes all things new. Yes, transformation, absolutely. Yes, yes, the Beatitudes go along the same thing yes absolutely so what if god needs to make you struggle and go through a bunch of stuff in order for you to make that as paul puts it that transformation guess what he's going to do he's going to put you through it what if you get a bad attitude about it what if you get a sour you know feeling inside of you there you're, you're you know nothing is good god hates me you know you're, you're you're not learning you're not learning the lesson you're just complaining and that's what god says he goes um complaints what do we have to complain about that you know let's let's boil it down to the simplest terms that we understand god says i have offered you salvation reconciliation justification sanctification he says if you accept that is that not more than enough for the believer it is more than enough if God gives me nothing else in life if I live on the in a street for my whole life right with no you know modern conveniences but God saved me. Can I still praise his name? Can I still can I still give him that glory? Apparently, these folks could not. They saw him. They saw him work. They saw him do. They experienced him. He fed them spiritual food, spiritual drink. And yet, it says most of them most of them were not pleasing to God. It's a little scary, isn't it? Stop complaining. Start being just grat so gracious and, 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 you know, to give him that glory. You know, it will change your life. It'll, instead of saying what I don't have, say thank you for what you have given me. Anything else is just icing on the cake. Let's go back into our text now, verse 6. He says, Now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. All right, he's getting down into it here. He goes, there was, there was a bunch of sin that was happening inside of here, right? They were lusting for more than what God was providing. Can the world satisfy? Is there some possible way that we as believers are missing out on something 
that God has not provided. If you remember from our from our reading in John on Sunday, when Jesus says, I, I, I have given you the word, I've given you all that the Father has told me, I've given to you. That, that's what we need to realize. That's what we need to realize. Uh, verse 6. We're in verse 6. So, when our heart lusts after more than God provides, what it does is tells us that we have not accepted the things and the place and the position in which God has called us, right? We're not, in other words, we're not content with what God has given us, right? We are too busy looking at others. Uh, maybe they have this. I need more money. I need a big, I need a bigger house. I need a bigger car. I need the new iPhone. All those things are happening. When God says to true believers, I'm enough for you. I should be enough for you. We see here, it says, verse 6, now these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Okay? Verse 7, and do not become idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Here they are. Think of what's happening here. God takes them out of bondage. 400 years in slavery breaks those chains, fights for them, destroys the Egyptian army, opens the Red Sea, walks them through to his mountain where he's going to give them his, his commandments for them to live. What do you think that these people should have been doing? Praying, waiting patiently, right? Reflecting, learning what it means to be now free. Instead, what did they do? Built a golden calf and worshipped it. And all kinds of debauchery that went along with it. That's what it means. The children got up, right? They rose up to play. How's this fit into where we're, we're going tonight in 1 Corinthians 10? All right? Think about what Paul's saying. You're all believers in this church. Just as they all experienced the same thing, but most of them did not live a life that was pleasing to God. The, the way he's saying this, that we understand, he's actually telling them, most of you are not living the way you're supposed to be living. Right? And he's giving them examples that they can grab a hold of. Look at verse 8. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in the day, and in one day, 23,000 fell. Hmm. All right. Listen, it's hard for us to comp comprehend what was happening then because we live in a time of grace. We live in a time where, where we have been forgiven, that we have the Spirit. They did not, okay? They, they were dealing uh, with, with things in a way that we don't deal with them in the same way. So when we see things that are in our lives, or here, as this, this discussion is, in other believers' lives, other people that have experience the same thing you have experienced. They come to church with you maybe. Uh, they're believers maybe from a different section of God's church. Um, yes, even, even social media, yes. Um, so what happens is too many times, right, we take in so much of the world that it, it, it starts shooting out of us. And so what happens is when we're out of balance in life, when we don't take in enough of God, and when we don't take enough of his word, we don't take enough of his teaching, but we're, we're, we're lopsided or out of, out of balance and taking in too much garbage from the world, there's an easy way to understand it. Garbage in, garbage out, all right? 
you're filled up on that stuff you have no it has no no other way but to come out now what he's trying to get to them and what he's trying to tell them is this just as our fathers were tripped up see you have to realize what had happened these people were under bondage for a long period of time and now all of a sudden they're free they have they have you know gold they have silver you know they're you know the, of course what happens people rise up within the ranks start pushing people to go different places that they shouldn't go right we we hear it every day we hear it every day let's be more concerned about the things of god than be concerned about the things of the world and that goes for any aspect of the world any aspect i don't care what you're trying to section off and say this is more important than that's than that and this is more important than that the most important thing is jesus christ where we are with him are our hearts right are we are we taking in the spiritual food and the spiritual drink that we that we need to um we'll get to that because he's going to pull this all together for us all right verse nine nor let us tempt christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents we we know if you've ever did studies on that whole situation where they they were just wandering right exhausted one thing came after another people were dropping um man it just makes you think about this world it's like it's the wilderness that we wander in and and you know there's so many things that can get us out there and we're so willing to to go there it's like when jesus is you know in our in our reading from john where jesus is cleaning the feet of of the disciples you know and he says you know peter you know i'm gonna clean your feet peter says no and then he goes listen if you don't let me clean you then you have no part of me and then peter comes back and he says yes lord my feet my hands my head um and we talked about this on sunday and it's so important that you know it, it, our head is you know where does it where's our mind taking us right and our hands you know where's our hands where they take us and and most of all where do our feet take us because wherever we go our feet are the one uh, are the things that experience that first right so if we don't go there guess what we save our hands we save our mind hmm. verse 10 verse 10 nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer he's he's making a big point of this complaining thing and, and, and i agree totally that i think this is one of the biggest pitfalls of believers is that they complain about everything i mean i i can tell you from experience whenever we were doing anything we have a, a bunch of people come together we're going to do an event or we're going to do you know even a food giveaway or whatever i will tell you every time before anything started i'm talking with people about complaining and bad attitudes every time every time i said listen if you see something wrong fix it don't complain about it don't belittle somebody if they don't know how to do it or they're doing it wrong help them fix the problem instead what do people like to do complain just complain oh look what Oh, you're 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 hurting this you're doing that you're do but does that help anything does that do anything except dwell up more negative feelings you spread it to to other people right if you don't bring the light with you how then are other people supposed to experience it let's go over to first corinthians 5 when Paul was dealing with a deep issue here, and and let's read it. Let's read it. Yes. So in 1 Corinthians 5.9, he says, I wrote to you in my epistle 
not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or the covetedness or extortioners or idolaters since then you would need to go out of the world. Okay, is there any way we're going to sidestep some of the evils that are happening in the world? No. Are we supposed to? No. We're not supposed to. We're supposed to see them and understand them. What he's getting at, he says, when you drag this stuff into the church, that's when the issues happen, right? The church is supposed to dictate to the world, not the world to the church. Verse 11 there says, But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. Now, let's get real about this. It, it, is, is that possible? No. I, I think everybody uh, deals with idolatry yeah, don't marry your stepmom. Yeah. <laughs> it seems so simple, Paul. <laughs> in, in a big, in a bigger expression and understanding that we're talking about here, I think we all deal uh, with idolatry in some way, shape, or form. Okay, uh, we're all guilty of one time or another. So, what's he getting to here? What he's saying is. Let good teaching, good doctrine be within the church so that when people struggle with an issue, no matter what that issue is, that we can be able to help them through it and bring them back to sound understanding. Okay? And I think that goes for any portion of Scripture. I think that goes for any issue at all, right? I think... Different people struggle with different things. Uh, not We don't all struggle with the same exact things. And when we get into a church, there's going to be a mishmash of what's happening within it. Therefore, what we need to do is go ahead and, you know, understand what grace means. Understand what lo how we lovingly bring people back into the fold. Um, now, we we're not going to get into it, but there's, there's times when they won't. And then, you know, that, that goes steps further. Uh, if you're looking for uh, the steps that we should take, uh, go Matthew 18, I believe, talks about that. Brother, you who are spiritually strong, restore one uh, that has uh, that has fallen. Uh, it kind of gives us the, the understanding. You go one-on-one, -on -one, then bring a couple of witnesses, then bring them to the church leadership. Um, you know, and so there, there's there's always ways to help people back get back on track, right? And let's not ever forget uh, that we too have sin in our lives and that uh, we, sh we shouldn't, yes. Well, you know, that's, Paul, that's a great point is like that even, that even scares us even more is like, and so that was Paul's point that was given in first Corinthians five. He's like, even the non-believers don't do this stuff. And isn't that scary though, that believers can go there. Wow, it's scary, you know. I mean, when even when the world says it's bad, <laughs> yeah, take note. Anyway, all right. So let's go. Let's go back in. So um, what we're seeing here, I think Paul has a unique way of laying out examples for people to grab a hold of. And, and to look at them and go, oh, you know, this is, I'm, I'm having an issue with this or I'm having an issue with that. And so what he's doing is because you probably had a certain sect of people like you do in most churches where they're like, you know, the, uh, the, the hierarchy, if you will, and they look down their nose at everybody else like that, you know, scriptures for everyone else. I'm good with God. And uh, that self-righteous nonsense uh, can be very ugly and it does more to turn people away from God then turn them towards God. Hey, Jack. And so <clears throat> realizing that and understanding that, uh, you know, we all have issues. And so we're all in the same boat. 
right? And, and I like to put this in easy terms so that you can understand this. It's like, okay, where's the path that we walk? It's between two curbs, okay? The first curb, I need a savior. I can't make it without him. The other curb, there's never going to be a time when I don't need a savior, okay? Here's our lane. Here's our path. We stay between those two. Never forget that. No matter where God bring you, brings you, no matter what uh, level you think that you're at, if you will, or right, or, or or understanding that. Listen, we're all sinners. We're all we all can't make it without without God. And uh, you know, our brothers and sisters, they need us. They need us when they struggle. They they don't need us to look down our nose at them. They don't need us uh, to belittle them or to. Uh, are you kidding? You do what? That, that has no place in church. What did Jesus say? Church should look like a hospital? Yeah. Yeah. It should. And we need to realize that, man. That's what it's all about. All right. Verse 11. Let's move on. Verse 11. He says, Now all these things happened to them as examples, and they were written for our ammunition, right? Or for our well-being for so that we could see them upon whom the ends of the ages have come what he's saying is this it's like it's like for our benefit god set forth these things that we see these folks struggling through them to bring us to understanding of what it means to be spiritually to be in touch with god his right they all experience the same thing not all of them got the same thing out of it they weren't all good to go so just by people experiencing what's uh, spiritual things does not bring them to repentant faith. All right? that, 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 those are two different things. And I think humbleness, as we see so much being brought out in Scripture about being humble, I think that's, you know, we have to, we have to go there, Paul, you know, what does he say? Oh, wretched man that I am, me chief among all sinners. Uh, you know, he, he always talked about, you know, how, how he was in such need. You know, it's only by the grace of God that, that, that anything happens to me. Um, man, I want to be that, too. I want to be that guy, too. I don't want to ever think that somehow, you know, I'm better than somebody else just because they struggle with something different than I do. Um, Man, I love I, I, I love the way Scripture just breaks you down. Right? What did you know? We've seen Isaiah standing at the throne. This the, these verses always get me. Where Isaiah is like he's saying, I, "I saw the throne and I was a man undone." You know, right down to my core. Um, God has a way of stripping away all the nonsense on the outside, doesn't he? And to you know, those who who love him, those who are believers, absolutely can see in in that reflection of themselves, they they have such a need for Christ. And, and that's important for us that we have that that knowledge and that need that we need Christ. Verse 12, he says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed unless he Falls. Whew. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus. What does that scripture tell us in Proverbs? Pride comes before the fall. I believe that's it. Interesting. We all struggle. We all struggle. We start looking down at our brothers and sisters. We start belittling, you know, the people around us or the people we come in contact with, um, I can tell you clearly, you are on the wrong track. I don't care what that person has done. I don't care where they've been. That is not the heart of a believer. Verse 13, he goes into a little more detail here. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to, to man. But God is faithful. Who will allow you? Who allow you to? Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able? 
But with that temptation, he will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. What? This is a very famous verse. God doesn't give us any more than we can handle. What does that mean? What does that mean? Hey, Pearl. <laughs> That's okay, John. What does that mean? He doesn't give us more than we can handle. Well, how does that work? Is it just whatever we have, God's there, God's there for us? Is that the way it works? And, and that's just an abstract understanding? Of course not. What, what, when God's trying to redeem you and bring you back, you know what he does? He puts people in your life. He puts people there. His people. He's working circumstances so that to help you come into knowledge and understanding, right? So that when you experience the spiritual food, when you experience the spiritual drink, the living water, that it actually takes hold. You can see it in other people. And what do you say? I want that. I need that. I got to have that. Bring the light with you. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, John. <laughs> he stops just short of running you off. Yes, I, I would agree with that. All right. Let's go over to Romans 11 and verse 18. And we kind of see this whole thing coming together um, where he says, you know, don't go places where you shouldn't go, right? Uh, don't beat up on people. Don't attack people. Uh, don't go there. Look what he says in Romans 11, verse 18. He says, do not boast against the branches. But if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. Be careful about talking down on other believers, other churches, other ministries, uh, other faiths. Right? That's what he's saying. Listen. Love, grace, mercy, understanding. Where are those? Right? Keep those at the top. Verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said. Because of unbelief, they were broken off. And you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches... He may not spare you either. Judge. Right. That's what judge not means, Jackie. It doesn't mean we shouldn't judge things. It doesn't mean we shouldn't understand things. We shouldn't have discerning spirits. We shouldn't test all things. Right? That's not what it means. It means when it comes down to people, when it comes down to people, stop beating them over the head about things. That's not your job. Stop doing it. Your job is to lead them to faith, through love, right? What does that scripture say? Do all things through love, right? Let all things that you do be done with love. Um, does it mean that through the struggle that you won't get, you know, upset or disappointed or, or, or have feelings about it? That's fine. But let's stop hanging things on people. The, you know, the whole thing about being in Christ is to unburden yourself, right? Is to give those, give that weight away, give that weight away to God. Um, we as believers should not be hanging weights on each other. All right. Interesting. All right. Let's go on to verse 14. Verse 14. He says, Therefore, my beloved, or believers, Flee from idolatry. What can be idolatry? What can be idolatry? Anything that you put in God's place. That's idolatry. Right? God says, I'm first, no matter what. Idolatry can be, I know somebody their whole life was golf. Um... Or fishing, it could be, or maybe a sports team, or you know, it, it could be, it could be anything. You know, uh, drugs, alcohol, the the ones that come to mind easily uh, could be uh, just a bad attitude, right? We talked a lot about attitude, uh, where 
um, you know, that's, that's your thing. You know, you're always in a bad out of bad mood, you know, um, we're not called, you know, what did Christ say? My joy, I leave to you so that your joy may be full. Uh, that's not joy. So therefore that becomes idolatry because it, it's contrary to what God, for, for what God is, is, is trying to help us live in what manner that is. Right. So that becomes idolatry, even though it's not a thing. Right. And it's not a thing you can touch. It's, it, it becomes idolatry. Also, it could be, I don't want to shake anybody here. It could be if you're putting the loved ones in in the first spot, right? Um, I have a lot of people, uh, you know, what do you love? I love my family. Are we supposed to love our family? Absolutely. But we're supposed to love God first. And, and I think your family would be more than happy if you put them in the number two spot. Because unless you have a relationship with God, unless you learn what love is unless you learn right through god how to love others because you loved him and he loved you first those relationships won't flourish so, listen stop putting things in front of god he doesn't like it he does not like it okay uh second corinthians which we're many weeks away from second corinthians <laughs> second corinthians 6 verse 14 he says do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness or what communion has light with darkness don't misunderstand what he's saying here does that mean that anything uh, you know that we cut out all unbelievers out of our lives I hope everybody said no. How are you supposed to reach the lost? And think of it like this. We all started out as unbelievers. Right? We're all born into this world as an unbeliever. That's why Jesus said you need to be born again. You need to take on a new, a new heart, a new nature to be born again. Well, what he's saying is, what he's saying here is, don't get in and mixed in and do the same things that they're doing, right? You're supposed to live on the edges, trying to pull them to you, not live on the edges and then pulling you inside of it, or whatever it is that thing is. That's what he says. For what has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness and what accord has Christ with Biel? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever and what agreement has the temple of God with idols? They're nothing. They're completely contrary to one another. You have to understand this. We don't look like them. We don't act like them. We don't walk the same way they walk. We don't think the same way they think. Of course they're going to think we're crazy. Because of one thing. Because of one thing. Look at the end of verse 16 there. For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell with them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Yeah, of course they don't do the same things you do. They'll act the same way or think the same way because they don't have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within them. It should look different. It should be totally different. And until they come into full knowledge of saving faith, they will be like that. But if we don't give up on them. We don't close the door on them. We don't kick them out. Listen, I want every unbeliever in the world to come to church. I want them to sit there and hear God's word and let him work on their hearts because that's his job. It's not mine. My job is to be the light, to be the salt, to put it out there, to bring it with me. That's what I'm supposed to do. And then I will do that till the day I that God till the day that God calls me home. I will dwell with them. I'll walk among them. I will be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, he says, come out from among them and be separate. We know this as being sanctified which means to be separated from in other words i don't do those things anymore i don't live like that anymore i think differently my heart has been changed about what sin is and what repentance actually means and how i show grace and how i show mercy because god showed grace and mercy to me and for i forgive because god forgave me and that his sacrifice on the cross was more than sufficient was more than sufficient to do exactly what needed to be done 2 Corinthians 12, where Paul says, you know, when God says, 
my grace is sufficient for you in all matters, in all things. In other words, the sacrifice was enough. We have nothing to complain about. Stop complaining. Start rejoicing. Rejoice in the Lord, I say, and rejoice again. Be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Yes. You know, by all accounts, God asks us to do some really hard things, right? Don't give people what they deserve. That's mercy. Help them through the difficult parts, even though you may have not understand it or it's of their own making. That's grace. Paul, you said it best right there from Matthew 5. Love your enemy. Don't pay them back. That's not who you are. That's not what you're supposed to do. Let God take care of that. Don't poison your heart and your mind and your spirit with that. You love, even when they don't deserve it. Because God loved us when we didn't deserve it. And that's the example that we have. All right. Well, I know our time is done already. <laughs> uh, so uh, we will be doing uh, Easter on Sunday. We won't be in John. Okay, so, uh, but we will pick up the next week. Uh, we'll be, and then we're going to do a discussion about grace. But tune in, Easter. Easter's going to be early, 9 o'clock. All right. Uh, it's going to be a short program. Um, so, yeah, I hope to see you guys. And if you can't make it on, you know, it's, pop in sometime during Easter. Say hi. Make a comment. Happy Easter. Um, and, uh, you know, listen, God bless you this week. Just... I hope he just pours out his love upon you uh, the way he did on the cross because it, it, is, it is way more than enough. Way more than enough. And always remember that. All right, let's go ahead and pray and then I will let you all go. Father, thank you. Thank you for helping us to understand a little bit better the kind of people that we're supposed to be. And we love when we shouldn't. We bless when, they get, when we're cursed. Lord, and then it's not about us doing everything, but it's about being there when we can. Father, I'd ask that you bless everyone that is here, especially this week. Everyone that will be here. Everyone that hears your message. That comes forth and want to hear your word. That you would touch their hearts as only you can. And Lord, we all ask for that blessing upon our lives. That that indwelling of the Spirit would be with us. Lord, that we accept you fully. We stop complaining. And start being just absolutely overwhelmed by what you have done for us. That, that that gladness that's in our heart would just pour out to all those around us. That we would put you first. So that we could just learn to understand how to love others. So Father, be with us here again. As we come in the next few days to just celebrate you. To glorify you. To praise your great name. And it is in Christ's name we pray and all God's people said... Amen, amen.